I'm Celisha Obo. Um, I'm coming to you today from the Musqueam Territory. I'm originally from Arley, Montana, um, Salish and Crow, and I'm here to help moderate the conversation. Um, today, we have Derek Witcherly with us, and <clears throat> Derek is a visual artist specializing in fine art, printing, and paper making. Derek earned an MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island. He served as a printer and studio manager for the etching workshop Harlan and Weaver in New York City from 2012 to 2019. Derek is currently the collections manager of the Montana Museum of art and culture. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over to Derek and he's gonna talk about his art. Okay, thank you, Salisha. Thank you, Stoney and Kelly and everyone at Open Air. Um, so yeah, start by saying Tansi. It's a Cree greeting and um, I'm going to start very my slideshow soon. Um, but yeah, first of all, I just say thank you all for being here, for coming, um, and for the invitation. And I'm glad you're here to see an artist talk because I feel like it's probably the best way to get to know me and what I think about when I'm making art, which is a big, you know, part of my life. Um, and this is first artist talk I've done since last fall. So it'll be fun for me to kind of re-engage with my practice this way and to meet, you know, everyone here in the community. I just moved back to Missoula last August, um, but I was born in Missoula and grew up mostly in, in uh, Pablo and Ronan and Polson and um, Great Falls, Haver and um, yeah. So I'm a Montanan who came back after being away for 16 years on the East Coast. And I'm gonna open up my slideshow now. So yeah, I am an enrolled member of the Chippewa Cree tribe, a uh, citizen of Rocky Boys Reservation on my mom's side. And I'm also of European and settler descent. Um, and Salisha already kind of covered these CV items. Um, so I'm just gonna start off by showing you some artwork. And what I've been doing, hopefully by the end of it, you understand some of the ideas behind it, but for now, I just wanna show you the stuff. Um, I create works of, you know, made of paper and I create the paper um, pigmented and layered and and uh, overprinted with patterns. Um, pattern design is a big kind of container for my drawing. It, it provides me with a structure similar to um, how in conceptual art, you can almost write a set of rules and then hand it over to someone else to create the work. Like I, I use pattern as a means of organizing my drawing. Um, and this piece is, it's based on the, the color green. And I thought it was a timely way to start it out since it's starting to green up outside, um, spring out. And it's an abstract interpretation of the view from you know my own experience of being like inside of a ceremony. And I think that's as much as I will like share about the particulars of it. Um, in my work, I also like to try to strike a balance between sharing and oversharing too, and letting certain audiences pick up on certain things and and then also having enough there that it stands up as a fine art print and a you know a fine art. So um these interconnecting little lines can be seen as you know structural 
but also as like paths of visitation and um, you know, connections between places and people. And then they create this trellis or net and behind it is a rolling hills to kind of invoke the landscape around the bear paws um, during like a few minutes in spring they're really bright green and then everything dries out but um that's what was the idea behind this piece and it was actually a, a part of a portfolio for hand paper making magazine um, their portfolio theme that year was the language of color and um so I, I chose green for that. And you can see that the pieces when laid out in a group interconnect across sheets and I'll keep as a theme in the work. Um, this was called crossing. And I like to invoke um, kind of the, the nice side of things or, or like um, things I like to remember, but then also the the seedy side of everything. So this is about inner escape and visiting the same place over and over again um, and having it different each time, but also about, you know, these like red zones you can interpret as being like okay to go to, or you could interpret them as like the land chopped up into, you know, reserves and um you know i leave them open to interpretation that way essentially it's it's a modular piece made of three engraving and dry point plates so it's three copper plates printed on handmade paper and then composed together and spliced with strips of kozo or sheets of kozo and it, it adhered to that for the backing paper um, to create each panel, which is composed of nine prints. And then those can further be modular to create a bigger composition composition like this. Um, for reference, each panel is about three by three feet. So the whole thing is like six by six. Um, and this is a way also for a printmaker like me who likes working small and focusing on nuance and detail um to like be able to talk about something as as big as the land and that we occupy um so i use repeat patterns to talk about that concept of of infinity um also scarcity in the limited edition fine art prints um and both of those concepts were used to like advertise to settlers to come out into the west but then also to chop up the land and sell it into parcels um this piece is called sector cycle and it's two images they're lithographs on handmade paper over pulp painting um and they connect you know they're they're printed in four sets of 16 and then each set can be organized into like a diamond formation and put together. And I do kind of reference beadwork when I'm coming up with the design for some of these um, modular handmade paper print pieces. Um, and that's, you know, some of them get into patterns that are embedded into the landscape in a way. Um, so this, and then in different shows, they might be organized in different ways. Uh, and the printing in this one was really variable. You can see where the ink is scumming up on the litho stone and spreading and getting darker and darker. And as well as the sheets underneath, like each one is different. And that again, is to talk about like kind of returning to the same place, but it's constantly in flux um, and through different kind of seasons and weather um this is the the pulp pressed into sheets um that's the press it's basically a car jack with um some armature and you can see the green and ochre base sheets with i use stencils to kind of mask off areas and then within that we'll pulp paint 
using squeeze bottles, kind of like a restaurant ketchup bottle uh, full of pigmented pulp. And those pulps can be beaten to like different finenesses to get different effects. Um, and you can use different fibers to also create different kinds of paper. So you can see the two images here. And I was working two at a time creating these sets. And you can see why each one is different too and how kind of um, irregular and almost by chance some of the, the painting and color shapes are. I like those chance operations in my work too. Um, this is me picking fiber out from the pellons when you press the sheets. Uh, but just so you can see how the work is made in mass, but each one gets a lot of individual attention. Um, this was in the classroom in Minnesota, right? St. Ben's and St. John's um, was an interesting experience because it was a Catholic ex boarding school for indigenous people out there. Um, and they were still kind of dealing with that history finally. So um, I enjoy teaching opportunities too, and I've done workshops, but I feel like when you get printmaking into the hands of, of people who don't get to make a lot of art, it, it gives them enough structure that they can really, uh, they can make art without stopping themselves, you know? Um, so this is another of those handmade paper editions. Um, the mold and decal here has fine pulp draining out of it, and you can see the stencil is gonna be removed after that sheet drains. So you would just get those rectangles. Um, and this was a piece that I was invited to create a benefit uh, broadside for hand paper making magazine for them to raise their annual funds. Um, but I was able to choose a writer to work with and the design of the project. And then I had some collaborators to help me on it. Um, so I chose the poet and artist and musician and all around as um, Leanne Simpson. She's a uh, Ojibwe from up in Canada. And you can see these um, brick pieces are based on her poem um, listed here. And that poem is in turn based on a performance by one of my favorite performance artists, Rebecca Belmore. And in the original performance, um, she painted milk and three big white X's on the side of a grocery store, um, where across the street from that performance, and again, this was in Canada, they were um, doing a parking lot for the grocery store and had uncovered the remains of some indigenous people there. Um, and that was what Rebecca Belmore's performance was in response to. So this is like, you know, there's like a lineage of indigenous women performance artists that I was inspired by to create the, the handmade paper piece. This is what it ended up looking like installed at St. Benedict's. Um, promise you the sheets were more flat, but it was in the fall and when the heat kicked on, uh, Paper is, you know, you're always collaborating with water when you're making paper. Um, and the sheets still had some humidity and dampness in them. So when they turned on the heat, that rapid humidity change, you know, the paper naturally started curling, um, which was kind of a cool, unforeseen form of resistance the piece was doing. <laughs> Uh, and around this show, there was some programming where teachers had, you know, dance students come and they actually sent me videos of um, students doing interpretive dances based on this piece. And that was a really kind of mind blowing thing for me to see, too, because then that um, that original art that Rebecca Belmore made, you know, keeps going through artists' hands, and then finally these young 
Catholic students or students at a Catholic school were reacting to it. Um, so like bringing, bringing art and ideas into contexts that they're like desperately needed, something I'm interested in. Um, this is a close up of that in the final product. Um, and right after this show, they were packed up and sent, might still be for sale for their benefit. They were pretty cheap. Um, and I was able to keep a few proofs for myself. And this is the poem. I'm gonna let you look at it for a moment. And I want to read just this second column, I guess. Um, we are the singing remnants left over after the bomb went off in slow motion over a century instead of a fractionated second. It's too much to process, so we make things instead. And I really recommend looking at Leanne Simpson's work and theory. She did this book called, um, I'm going to space it out. Um, anyway, it'll come later, but uh, this is from a collection of poetry of hers called This Accident of Being Lost. Um, this is more work from that show, and these are you know, my own abstract images. This was originally based on witnessing the effects of wind on snow out there on their campus, because um, it was rural in Minnesota on a record snowfall year. And uh, you can see this is like Abaca base sheets with cotton in the the rough stripes in the middle and it was raw cotton so there's still like seeds in it and when you beat them to a certain consistency those little bits of seeds it almost creates this like sand texture um and it's something that these photos don't exactly communicate but you can see again they have a formation and create a mass and um their presence that way but something of what i love is to create um sheets that are like pulling against each other so if if one sheet's fibers are super fine when they dry there's more shrinking and then if another sheet on top is more uh like a, a shorter beater time and a longer fiber they won't shrink as much um so they kind of stay more stable but i like creating um works that have tension like in the ideas in them but also just tension in the materials and seeing them crinkle and behave like paper and retain some of that trace of like water and fiber material this is another of those modular pieces that i actually based on um signs and you know, structures that tell you dictate to you how to how to behave um, this is for teaching pattern systems, but just to show you, this is something I learned as a grad student um, and kind of happened upon in a book, but I found it really enabling. Um, and I use it when I'm teaching little short workshops because again, creating a pattern gives you this structure to draw within that the students sort of forget all of the self-conscious stuff that stops them from drawing. Um, and this might just help you understand how the how the patterns function like in a real technical way. Half drop versus brick, it's the same thing, just one is on its side. And again, going back to that idea of like slashing the landscape into pieces and parceling it out um, as sort of a complete 
in complete opposition to traditional indigenous ways of being on the land, you know, even though there's still territories and conflicts and everything. Um, it's kind of just utterly different reality that we're in now is uh, Posing forms of objectivity um, and trying to mash it all into one piece. So this was called a regional fair. Fair is spelled like the price of a ticket you would have to pay to go somewhere. And um, this is what it looked like in its complete form. This was one of the first pieces that I made in this um, style. It's another lithograph uh, drawn on stone and printed over handmade paper. And then as the individual prints sell the overall mass like shrinks so the last time i showed it it was it looked like this um and again that's referencing that scarcity and in a real way bringing up how a fine art print can be a metaphor for that kind of economic system um this is a process shot for you to see what the lithographs look like when they're being drawn on stone. And then those are etched and um, printed onto the handmade paper. This is another sample of, of that kind of work. And another, this is done in reduction relief. Uh, printed in two colorways and then stitched together by hand, cut and um, adhered using an archival double stick stuff called Goody. And uh, again, bringing up patterns embedded in the landscape. And I wanted to show you this because it's the hand made version of, you know, I also do digital repeat patterns. So usually the stitching and cleaning up the the splices is done in Photoshop and it's turned into a repeat pattern there. Um, this one is a three plate color aquatint etching. And so that's a motif for a repeat. And then I'll put it into the computer and create the kind of um, more simple and bizarre looking thing on the side the digital repeat and that's a bucket tool so I can just plop that into any size composition and I you'll see soon for grad school I ended up producing inkjet prints out of out of those repeat patterns so you'd have this fine art um, sort of precious version and then these limitless versions um, this one is called damn it all this is Kind of about the absurdity of damming all of the rivers but also about the hoops we have to jump through or the hurdles we have to get over to like exist in society um and that concrete of the dam is my my stand-in for infrastructure and institutions um that kind of dictate how you have to move through the world um, and this was used to produce a repeat pattern that I printed on canvas here, and then I printed it on cotton and used it in some installation work. Um, this was a performance I did called Institutional Support. It uses that same dam motif um, on cotton broadcloth, which is like a, a ceremonial material is how I had run into it before as like an offering fabric. But this is um. I don't always like tell the audience that, you know, they can pick that up maybe sometimes, but this is during the pandemic too. So you can kind of see my, my uh, face mask through the cloth and I'm suspended with the fabric on a column that is part of UW Madison's humanities building. It's this old brutalist building where the art facilities are. And like a month after this performance, right above that column, they discovered that the lithography shop and all the stones and the presses over all the decades had created a structural problem in the building. So they had to like close down that whole 
area and put in a metal brace in place. Um, it didn't actually have anything to do with me, but it felt like I was uh, calling out problems there. Um, and then the idea of being wrapped was kind of a part of another body of work we're getting into now about, well, just a second, but you're, you know, in grad school, you're in this transitional phase and you're not sure if you're going to emerge this like glorious butterfly artist or just get absorbed into the institution. Um, so yeah, that's, that's some of my performance work. Um, and it, it, the wrapping got me into this concept of gift giving, which is, um, you know, I didn't get a lot of traditional knowledge growing up, but one of the things I did from my Cree side was, you know, you're supposed to like give without expecting anything in return, which is very different from gifts in other cultures where there's, um, you know, responsibility or like influence gained or, uh, you know, bribes or there's all kinds of CD versions of gifts when you think of charities and, and like soft power. But, um, you know, the indigenous way of giving gifts is, is about connecting people like within communities and between communities and also between humans and non-humans or greater than humans. Um, so our natural environment and the animals around us. Um, and this was a collaboration with Robin Wall Kimmerer who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass. It's another broadside that I did as a benefit. This one was for the like indigenous speakers fund at St. Benedict's and St. John's. Um, so they used that to raise money to bring in indigenous speakers like Robin. Um, so we have a quote from her about gift giving. Um, and then these are my images and they're based on work I'm doing in Colograph um, about wrapped objects that are natural entities. And then I do performances where people are cutting shapes out of chipboard, like thin cardboard to try to honor some element of nature they want to pay respect to and then wrapping them up. And then I would take those, shellac them, ink them up as collagraphs and print them on, on fine art paper. Um, so this was a participant made plate um, that I then stepped in as the printer. Um, but it's my artwork. I don't give the participant the credit for the artwork. Um, and through the printing process, I try to like visualize, you know, the the hands and the actions that like act that the the participant in the performance, um, down to like the scotch tape and their little scissor marks. So I use the printing process to like show what's happening. Um, these are from the same series of performances. It was called Wrapped Gifts but wrapped was spelled R-A-P-T. Um, and these are printed on handmade paper and we're nearing the end of the talk. But I just wanna give you a little bit more about the gift giving side um, because I feel like that's still a part of the current work with the modular pieces, but it's, it's not as explicit. This is another pressure print. It's the technique that the Robin Wall Kimmerer broadside was printed in. So these were almost um, documentation for performances. And this is a, those inkjet patterns, I use them to produce wrapping paper and would give those out to participants that go to the performances. And that's what we were using to wrap things in. Um, in one of them, they showed up and saw this, and they had provided those objects, but then um, I was inside the the big one, and um, this is kind of questioning my role as the artist, and um, 
just thinking about, you know, in this context, what I have to give often is, is artwork and engagement. Um, and this is stuff that I still think about now that I'm working at, at a art museum because you're in the institution, you're part of it and trying to find ways to, to make it, make it not, uh, how most of them function. So, um, this was my friend, Jimmy, and I just thought it was a, it's the performance. And, um, this one, I got a photo from a past student in a workshop when I holograph workshop at Anderson Ranch and they sent, you know, a photo of how the, how it was used. So I have these kind of documentation photos of the stuff actually being used as it's intended. And this is how my, um, MA show went in grad school. I had a pile of, for just a little part of the show, this is how the wrapping paper was presented. And the dictation was that they have to like use it if they're going to take it. So it's again, kind of challenging that role of fine art versus something that's, um, you know, the value is in, in other places. It's not like the retail. It's how it's used and how people are connected. Uh, this is another rendition of that idea where people took the sheets out, brought back objects wrapped in them. And I used like a Christmas tree idea to do this because that's the dominant culture's way of thinking about like this gift giving is such a specialized moment in time for most people. Um, and then at the MFA show, these wrapped up objects were given to people that came to them. Um, and that's my talk, but I do want to give a plug for a workshop I'm going to do um, for open air. This is my beater and it will be there. And we're going to make some paper out at uh, Lolo. Uh, Kelly will give the details, but it's in May, about a month away. So yeah, I'd be happy to take some questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you, Derek. That was awesome. Thanks, um, Alicia. Yeah, if anybody has any questions they can ask. Um, okay, we have a question from Amy Simpson Timber. Hi, Derek. Thank you so much. Um, that was such a wonderful uh, presentation. I really love the process of art making so much and you really beautifully had a lot of space um, for that process discussion. One of the things that I'm really curious about because, and you kind of just barely touched on it right at the end there. Now, you know, you're in this, you went from school, which was just completely uh, immersed in art making and process and, and art as your life. And then you took some time and worked for an incredibly impressive um, art space and went on to grad school. Now you're in this space and in this um, institution and um, and I'm I, I'm dying to know how you are managing that transition and how you um, continue to create um, in all of these other you know dynamics that are going on in your life. Yeah. So I learned a while ago that I do have to like choose what I do in my art practice because I want to do everything, but then I don't finish anything. So that's why I'm focusing like in this pretty particular vein of my work right now with, with handmade paper and printmaking. Um, and, Part of me would love to take 
old catalog cards from 1895 and put them up on the wall and say, you guys, look at this. Like, this is crazy. Um, Cause like the, 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 the racism and the colonial mind is like extremely clearly written out in them. Um, the way that objects are documented and, and, you know, cataloged. You know, here we are 128 years later, um, and, you know, I don't think the people I work with are not, like, everyone is trying their best to make the best institution we can, but, like, the baggage is there and it's real. So um, there's also a balance between you know, being performative and then actually doing the work. So I I try to just be, I'm learning a lot because I've been here since August. And, before, you know, it is my first time working in a museum. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm trying to kind of keep my art practice sort of separate from from what I'm learning for a while until I have more time to process and and think about ways of of doing it but like and in that separation i'm also trying to like use the position and the positionality of like being at the museum to wherever i can offer it as a platform for artists that i want to support and um yeah and it also makes it so I can avoid conflicts of interest by not trying to get my own art like in the <laughs> museum work. Um, yeah, and I'm still, my, my art making in Montana is in its infancy now, but I am investing in my, my home studio and trying to come up with ways to make paper this summer um, outdoors. I have some ideas in mind. So, for now, it's going to be kind of a seasonal practice for paper making, but hopefully I can get like etching and printing um, going well at home because I was lucky to find a good kind of work live space in Missoula. Um, I probably didn't answer your question, Amy, if you want to rephrase or anything or. Oh, and Kelly just put in some details for that paper workshop. You did answer my question, um, it, and it, and I, it was like two part question. So thank you. Um, appreciate your, I appreciate your candor. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'd like to encourage folks. If anybody does have questions, you're welcome to. You know, if you can find the emoji to raise your hand, you can do that. Feel free to unmute and jump in. Also, feel free to drop questions down in the chat if you prefer. Um, that approach. I have a question for you, Derek. Um, I thank you so much for sharing. I had a sense that it would be fascinating, and um, and and it sure was. And and I had goosebumps and tears and all all of it. It was um, really really wonderful. And I love the way that you're working to engage the viewer. And and so I kind of have a question around that, um, particularly with the pieces that you're dealing with land and the segmentation and ownership of land and how you've like taken that concept and use that um, in these repeating parts that you then have sold off to, you know, uh, uh, purchasers of your artwork. And I guess I wonder, like, how do you view the, um, the investor, the purchaser of your work at that? Are they kind of, are they a silent and unwitting collaborator in this um, uh, idea that you are, that is ultimately a performance. It's it's set up in a way that is kind of familiar for people with, you know, art objects and buying art objects, but actually it's this kind of performative piece. Are you thinking about it that far and are people complicit when they buy your work? <laughs> well, yeah, I did this one performance where I dressed up in a suit jacket and acted like a German dealer and had a print of mine in the background and the people 
in the it was in a class the other students were like the buyers or the people coming to visit the gallery and every time I like added a five percent discount and you know made it so the artists would get less of a cut I'd throw a dart at the print and like devalue it that way too um so like I yeah I think about this stuff and it annoys me that I think about it so much because I don't actually sell that much work but it does end up in spaces that I'm probably not going to go into like some ski lodge or something and the people there are probably not going to know the the like critical parts of it um but it's kind of like real life where you have to perform well like you have to act a certain way to succeed and I don't want to give them everything you know I don't want them to necessarily be in on the the that part sometimes so like um yeah it's a bit of a I, and I do appreciate the support and I do think that the people I work with are are doing good work generally. Um, but I've just seen a lot of shit, like from when I was selling much more famous artist work to, you know, much more wealthy collectors when I was working in New York for the print shop. So um yeah there there's something from that experience in there too of like kind of being the um and even as as an artist like i like to be in a support role sometimes just as the printer for other artists or getting someone else's words out in this other means so um it's kind of like the gift giving thing where like the robin wall humor Braiding Sweetgrass, her big concept in there, or one of them is that um, in an indigenous way of gift giving, you like give the gift and then it ends up continuing onto other people and it might not come back to you directly, but it's if everyone acts that way, it ends up being like a mutually kind of uh it's not a race to the bottom like we do now so um i do accept that you know gift of a sale or something but i don't feel like i have to like not always um give them like a hundred percent of the whole story and i like pieces like that too because it's subtle because generally you'll just look at it and see something you know like beautiful materials and colors and you know natural shapes and landscape itself is a very like non-critical genre generally so I try to like put in as much of my um that part of me where I can't just be a hundred percent happy with everything uh I just let that side be to load it all in. Hey, thank you. Um, is there anybody else who has any questions right now? I wanna hear your questions, Alicia. Um, my question, um, it has to do with you moving from landscape to landscape, because you said you had spent um, some time 16 years away and I'm sort of embarking on that right now <laughs> and um, just wondering how you know being in the different places and um, also being around the different cultural influences how that um, how that is now that you're back like how is that influencing you right now yeah I do feel like my whole kind of nervous system is calmed down a little bit since I came back, but, and then revved up in other ways, because all the, you know, I love being around family, but it's like a lot of stuff is happening all the time. Um, but 
and then and in New York or Rhode Island, especially my first place was like pretty shocking, you know, culturally, and it's mostly rich kids from New York. And it was a diverse place, but I didn't feel seen or represented that way, and I just kind of could like, yeah, just get through it. Um, and yeah, I feel like it's taken a long time. Like I always came back every summer to to visit family and keep me grounded. And even though it was like the same price to go to Europe or something, and I still haven't been to Europe. And uh, <laughs> but and then and then you run into like um, you know people when I do an artist talk among my like grad student peers. One student would be like, well. Are, does it really matter that much that you're like from Montana and from that background when you haven't even been there? And and it's kind of like, you know, another stereotype because indigenous people have always been traveling around the country and like exchanging knowledge and goods and learning. And, you know, the only reason we don't now is because we're on like, yeah you know the history but um it doesn't have to be like on the reservation you know and it doesn't have to be adhering to to all the stereotypes but um i am glad that i did bounce around and i feel like i took things away from all the the different kinds of people that I was able to interact with in different cultures. I really miss the food in New York and like all the different kinds of people. Um, yeah, and then coming back is, you know, a whole other challenge of like kind of reintegrating with um, family and everyone. You know, it's been a long time and everyone's like, you know, that much older and generations turning over. Um, yeah, no, it's intense, and I feel like it does add some urgency to my performance stuff, too, because it's, I always thought of here when I was making it, but now I'm actually here and can actually do it, you know, so um, it's also an exciting time. I just have to carve out more time for my art practice while I hold down a job, um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, does anybody else have any more questions? I I have another one for you, Derek. Um, you, you spent a little time with this on your first slide, um, but I get the sense, and I and I I I I get the sense that both like opacity and like your kind of inner thoughts, uh, like there's a privacy to your work as well as this like shared or continuation like between people and others and our relationship with with place um but can you can you share more about maybe i mean does the ceremony show up in your work like in this gift giving um uh, series that you're with do you use ceremony as like to kind of counterbalance maybe the very understated rage that also seems to be present like how where does it show <laughs> where does where does that show up for you if you if you're willing to share a little more about that <laughs> um yeah um i mean there's like explicit gift giving ceremonies that i think of as for inspiration like giveaways and I've thought about doing something more explicit like that because um, I want it to be subtle. I don't want it to just not get noticed or seen, you know, but. Um, and when I the what I say with the gift giving in artist statements is usually like, you know, gift giving, you know, I consider it an indigenous technology that has the potential to kind of moderate the relationships between communities and 
and non-humans. And that is kind of vague and college speaky. Like it's different when I'm at home just <laughs> and talking with my my family and stuff. But I I think just dealing with many different audiences is is part of that. But I do like I don't know if it's privacy really, but it's it's like standing up and saying, you know, I can like the dams piece, like I can, I'm in my lane, like I don't want to have to I I really appreciate artists that are so generous that they can bring their personal experiences and even like trauma into their work and and uh be really open about it um but i like those layers of interpretation to maybe make it more relatable in some ways um or that make people have to work a little bit harder to participate in it i don't I'm not so free and easy you know <laughs> and i mean it's just yeah, I, I think Indigenous artists, especially nowadays, are under a lot of pressure to like be very generous and and almost perform. And I always like to think of like um, the Edgar Heap of Birds that did the the piece that's called "Don't Dance for Pay." Um, it was like an art forum cover a while back. But yeah, I think you just have to be really careful and, and prioritize like if you're an indigenous person first and then an artist or, you know, a lot of people like pick and choose all the time. Um, so I, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of cautious about what I share, I guess. Thank, thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Salisha, I'm just offering some support here. I see Stella, you have your hand raised. Oh, yeah. Um, well, actually, just the conversation we just had from your question was really talking a lot about the thing that I wanted to bring up was just, um, well, I just wanted to say overall, I was so inspired by your talk and just thanks for sharing it with, with me um, and all of us and the Something that I was particularly interested in was just this concept of not over explaining your work. Since I feel for me as an artist and a native person, I feel like almost this sense of, uh, I'm not sure the word, like defensiveness or something. Like I feel like I need to over explain everything from a place of being afraid that it will be misunderstood. And yeah. I just really appreciate um, particularly that you're going straight to like gift giving, because I think that to me is something that has stood out always as a big cultural difference to me. Um, like it's something that I think when speaking to non-native audiences, it can be like perceived as to something totally different. Like, I don't know, I guess, for example, in, in some of my friend circles, like people have been talking about various love languages and such, and then popular culture popular culture and all that. Um, and people will take quizzes to see what their love language is. And then whenever it's gift giving, I've had people be like laughing about how that's the silly one and it's materialistic. And I can get where that's coming from, but I think just like because of the cultural components of gift giving for me, it's like, it feels like something I want to over explain and like just kind of talk to the point of like taking away the arts artistic value and like I feel like I really didn't explain all of this very well I'm like all worked up from being excited about thinking about all of these things but mostly I just wanted to say that I really appreciate all of your thoughts about this and it's helped me um to think about the way that I want to move forward as an artist and like try to allow for more um I guess give the audience more space to think about things and interpret them as they will without feeling this pressure to overshare in a way that makes me feel kind of uncomfortable. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Stella. And like really to anyone, I'm like 
part of why I'm here is I want to meet you guys and get to know you. So feel free to reach out to me and you know talk in less pressurized situations. Um, <laughs> although this has been a really welcoming room, so thank you guys for that too. Okay, so it looks like we're about out of time. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending Derek Wichley's talk and for supporting open air in this way. And um, Derek can be found. He has a website. Um, and then also he's in Missoula. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say thank you and thank you for a chance to be able to also converse with you and um yeah yeah thank you salisha and um i'm a big fan of your art too by the way thank you <laughs> yeah, that's awesome